Newfangled FM, a world of freedom. Welcome to the Consciousness Revolution Show with myself, Caroline Adair, on Untangled FM. I am hugely honoured to have on the show tonight international best-selling author of The Four Agreements, The Mastery of Love, The Voice of Knowledge, and The Fifth Agreement, Don Miguel Ruiz. Don Miguel was born into a family of Toltec Nawals, but he chose to attend medical school and become a surgeon. After practicing medicine for several years, he realized that what needed to be healed was not only the physical body and brain, but the human mind as well. A near fatal car accident, however, changed the direction of Don Miguel's life, and he experienced himself as pure awareness outside of the constraints of his physical body. He realized that the Toltec wisdom of his family contained all the tools needed to change the human mind. And Don Miguel promptly returned to his mother to finish his training and become a Nawal or shaman. Don Miguel moved to the United States after that to share his wisdom and spent 15 years exploring ways to heal and change the human mind. And during this time, he witnessed his students struggling to quiet their minds and sought to create tools to assist them. The result of this quest was The Four Agreements, published in 1997, which is on the New York Times bestseller list for over seven years, and his books have sold nearly 8 million copies in the U.S. alone. Don Miguel combines old wisdom with modern insights to give a new message to mankind based in truth and common sense. He has dedicated his life to sharing this new message through practical concepts that promote transformation. His message is simple, and when implemented, even incrementally, changes lives. Tonight, I am delighted to welcome Don Miguel Ruiz. Thank you, Don Miguel, for being on the show tonight. It's a great pleasure to be in your show. It's wonderful, and I'm very, very happy because this is uh, the first time that I will be in the United Kingdom. I'm extremely happy. It's a dream that is coming true. So you're actually going to be with us in October, I understand. Yes, uh, um, yes, it's next month. It's like a, uh, maybe like a three weeks from now. That's wonderful. I, I, I live at, I live in, uh, in October 3rd to, to Glasgow, and right. I'm very, very excited. Uh-huh. And you're traveling with your son, I understand, with uh, with um, Don Jose. Yes, Don Jose is coming with me. He's the, the author of the Fifth Agreement. Oh, that is just wonderful. I mean, that must have been such a special experience to write the Fifth Agreement with your son. Well, uh, he was so inspired um, because in, in 2002, I have a... Uh, um, a major heart attack. I was nine weeks in coma. And just a little before I went into coma, he came to see me. And for the first time in his life, he seen me so weak and with all those tools in the nose, etc. And for a moment, he lose control and he start crying. And at that moment, I stand up a little, I look directly into his eyes, and I tell him, Jose, this is the way that you will celebrate the death of your father, get out of the room, fix yourself, and when you're ready, come back because there's something, import, something important that I need to, uh, to, to teach you, to, to show you before I leave the body. And he was in a shock. He went out of the emergency room, and a few minutes later, he came back in everything changed completely in him. All his questions, it changed. And he looked at me and said, Father, I'm really sorry because now I can see all my selfishness. I was, uh, uh, I was so selfish of not letting you go and to use your death as a way to punish myself. Now that I have this awareness, I am no longer will do anything like that anymore. And this is how he started writing this, uh, this book, The Fifth Agreement. There is a conclusion for the first four agreements. That is wonderful. When, when was that, um, Don Miguel? When, when were you in hospital? 
It was in um, uh, February 28, 2002. It, it, was, um, it was a major heart attack when I woke up from the coma. And I find out that I only live with the 16% of my heart capacity, which is I only have enough blood for uh, my heart, of course, for the brain, for the lungs, that is the, mm. the main organs of the physical body, which yeah. means that uh, all my muscles, uh, they suffer for eight and a half years of not having enough blood. Then I was extremely skinny, and uh, mm. the doctors told me that, that I no longer can have the life that I used to have before, that from now on, I should stay in a room watching TV, reading books, but there is no way that I can uh, travel and teach the way I used to do before. Of course, I didn't say anything, but as soon as I was home, I called my three children, and I let them know that there is no way that I will stay at home just waiting for that. Even with the 60% of the heart capacity, I decide to keep teaching and to keep traveling. And I was living like eight and a half years in that condition, because uh, the heart attack uh, and the 16% of the heart capacity on, only make me slow, but I didn't stop teaching. And of <laughs> course, I had, I had pain all the time, but I discovered, uh, because it was no longer a theory, that suffering is just really just a choice. And yes, my body was in pain, but my mind was always enjoying life. It was a tribute to life just to keep uh, enjoying every single moment. And this is what I show to my children and to my apprentices also. And I let them know, well, if I can do it, you guys can do it too. And if you guys can do it, the entire humanity can do it. We don't need to complain. We need to enjoy life. We can see our life even in two different ways, like a victim or like a hero. When you see your life as a victim, you, you are overwhelmed for all the events that happen around you and that happen inside you. But when you see life as a hero, you see all those events like a challenge and you face the challenge, it doesn't matter the outcome if you win or you lose, but in every experience of your life, you learn more and, be, and make you stronger and stronger and stronger. Anyway, it was eight and a half years when I decided to, to change my heart and I went for a heart transplant, and I have a heart transplant in 2010. And after that, I've been traveling all around the world, just like before the heart attack. So it was amazing. It was an amazing experience to, to do that. Um, even taking that decision must have been quite a, um, quite a step. Well, yes. Uh, <clears throat> I've been uh, used to be a, a surgeon. At a certain moment, I, I find out that it was more important for me to understand the human mind more than the brain because I, I was part of my, my brother's team because he is, he's a neurosurgeon. And I used to go to most, all, almost all of the sur surgeries that he did. And I was so used to, to, to um, help the surgeries of brain and spine. But then I want to know more than the brain I want to understand how the mind works. And this is what made me return into my parents, into my legacy, and, and becomes uh, kind of like a shaman that was a, uh, I really never went a, a, a away from, from science, but it was a different approach. And in that way, it was easier for me to understand the human mind. I worked for, with my apprentices for more than 10 years until the mind was so clear for me. And the result of all that study with my apprentices is uh, all the books that I wrote. Because the Four Agreements, Mastery of Love, Voice of Knowledge, all those books is nothing but psych your psychology. It's nothing but common sense. What I do is to give tools that anyone can use in order to change their own life, to change the way they live their life, and only they make the choices that they need to do and nobody else. I only share tools. That's what I do. And the tools that you share are, they, they appear to be simple, but they are so profound. 
I mean, the, the four agreements, I think, has made, uh, certainly for me, it made a major change in my life. But also, I think, for people all around the world. Um, it, and, and what I find fascinating is reading, I've read the four agreements several times, and I've now read the fifth agreement several times. And each time you read it, you there's a deeper awareness and a deeper understanding. It, it's quite extraordinary. Yes, it is what makes this book uh, a classic because uh, the book doesn't change. The one who changes is the one who is reading the book. And yes, every time that you read the book, you find so many new things because you, your, challenges, your challenges are changing and you go deeper and deeper. It's like a heaven, like a heaven mirror that you can see your own awareness. You can see if, if all the limitations that, that you create for yourself that stop you to be what you really are. Then we can say that all those books really help you to become what you really are. In these books, they've been translated into the six different languages, and they're all around the world. And it's so wonderful to see the effect that is causing and a lot of the people. I'm so, so happy. And that's the reason why after the heart transplant, as soon as my doctors uh, told me that I can travel again, I've been all around the world, and it's almost uh, two and a half years of non-stopping. And I really enjoy what I do because this is my passion, to share what I receive, to share what I understand, and to keep, keep giving tools to everyone who wants to use it. It's completely, completely open for everyone. I think one of the most powerful messages that came through for me from the fifth agreement was that we are all messengers. I thought it was just lovely the way that you explained that and also explained that our life is our message. I think that that was something that I hadn't really thought about quite in that way before. Yes, this is something that I tell wherever I go. I say, well, I have to confess something that is very important. And what I say is that I believe in angels, <laughs> but not in the mythological angels, because the word angel means messenger. We all are messengers, which means every single human in the planet Earth is an angel. You know, we are artists. We are always creating and we always deliver our creation. We always deliver our messages. The, the, the wonderful question is, what kind of messengers are we? Are we a messengers of love or messengers of fear? This is, is something important. What is what we deliver to the people that we say that we love, like our children? like our beloved, like our parents, our brothers, or sisters, but mainly what is the message that we deliver to ourselves because this is the most important one. What is what we tell to ourselves that we are? Are we as bad as we say? Because we tell ourselves, I'm not good enough, I'm not strong enough, I'm not intelligent enough. Why should I keep going? And it's obvious that we are lying to ourselves, then our message that we give to ourselves is a lie. Then what kind of messengers are we? A messenger of truth or messenger of lies? Because this is the conflict that exists in the human mind. The conflict in the mind is not really between good and bad. The real conflict is between the truth and the lies. Good and bad is just a, uh, a result of the real conflict. If we believe in tr truth, for sure we will be good. If we believe in lies, we will be bad in different degrees according how deep is the lie that we believe. Because if it's so deep, we, be we create superstition, we become fanatics, and we really create a lot of trauma in our own lives and in the life of everyone around us. Because I, I, in your book, The Fifth Agreement, you do go into quite a lot of detail about how we got ourselves into this situation, our whole um, domestication of 
um, of human beings, really, um, creates what I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but mitote is that correct? Mitote, yes. Mitote. This is, yes, mitote is a Nahuatl word that means that there's uh, thousands of thoughts in our head that those thoughts go against each other, and there's no um, no control, there's no peace, there's uh, ongoing war in our own head. And you talk about um, really right from the beginning, we start to, well, through language, we start to take on belief systems that become very limiting. And also we, we end up taking other people's opinions and believing, believing those opinions to be absolute. Abs and, and then, as you say, we then are not good to ourselves in the way that we talk to ourselves or think about ourselves. So I see, I mean, the four agreements was, was really um, a, a wonderful kind of very simple, but as I say, very, very profound way, I think of making me and many other people realize that actually you can change your agreements. Well, uh, we, can, we should understand that everything that we know, Every single word, every sound that we know only exists in our mind because we agree, because it's an agreement. Then all the belief system that we have is millions of agreements that we did to ourselves and with people around us. And with those agreements, we use it to create the language that we speak, the entire belief system, and the way we create the, a masterful piece of art which is the story of our life, is what we believe about ourselves and about everything that we perceive. And this is uh, this this takes us to the very first agreement to be impeccable with the word, because uh, the word is what we use to create the story of our life. And if we use the word correctly, our own story will be our personal paradise. But if we use the word against ourselves, we will create so many traumas that we create a personal hell for ourselves. Then that's why the first agreement is the most important of the agreements, to be impeccable with the word, because the word is what really represents us. And... To be impeccable with your word, I mean, you do explain that many of us are far from impeccable with our word, and we we gossip, we say things that really can be very damaging to ourselves and, and mm -hmm. to others as well. Yes, it's like a, you said magic, mm. you know, um, the, the word is like a want that when we just use it without any awareness, we can create a lot of damage because people may believe what we say the same way that other people's words can affect us. It works like, a, like I call black magic. But of course, this is just symbology. It's not exactly true. Mm. But when we analyze that symbology, it really works in that way. So, for example, when you're a little child and you're told something, you're not good at something, or you're ugly, or whatever you're told, you can take that as a belief that um, that, that you it becomes part of you, and that's I guess that would be an example of black magic or using the word in in a negative way. Yes, yes, yes it's like putting a spell in somebody. Like the example that I put in that book, The Four Agreement, is that little girl, like I is maybe seven, eight, nine years old, that is feeling so happy, singing, dancing, and the mother comes back from work or whatever, and, and is been with a lot of stress, and have a headache, and she hears the, the daughter singing, dancing, and with that headache, she say, oh, just shut up. Uh, your voice is so ugly. Just 
give me some peace. And mm-hmm. the little girl, she, uh, she stopped singing. And just by believing what her mother said, that changed her life completely. Because after that, uh, she, may, she may never sing again. She can be very shy. And the whole personality of that little girl will change just because she agrees with the opinion of her mother. Then we have to be very careful, especially with our own children, because we can give opinions that we really don't mean it, but uh, once we did it, uh, we cannot take it back. And this is something important to understand. This is a message that we are giving that it is really a big lie because it's not true what we say. The word is very powerful. And I think um, you go on, that leads us really to not taking anything personally as we learn to go through the agreements and to um, to maybe break some of our agreements of the past. Um, for me, not taking anything personally was particularly, it was kind of like intellectually, I could really understand it, but particularly in situations where it was with maybe, you know, a loved one or somebody that mattered a great deal. Yeah. It was hard not to take something that they said personally. And I, it, that's something I've really had to work with. You know, this is something very interesting. Because uh, we learned to take everything personally since we were children, since we, since we grew up. But if we understand that uh, we create a story of our life, and it's only true for us but for nobody else. And in the story of our life, we create all the secondary characters, which is all the people that we think we know. And we also create the main character of that story, which is what we believe we are. Then that story, the whole story is about the main character, how we perceive everything, how we judge everything, how we react with everything that is happening around us. But we should understand also that everybody around us, they do exactly the same thing that we do. They create their own story. They create all the secondary characters, and they create the main character of their story. And in their story, we are only secondary character. Then they only know about us, but they believe about us because they really don't know us. Like we only know about the secondary characters of our stories, what we believe about them, but we really don't know them. And then all the secondary characters of the story, even that they are not real, they are based in reality, because it's true that our parents exist, our brothers exist, our children exist, etc. But the ones who live in our story, they are not real. Then when they talk about us, they're talking about the, the secondary character in their story because they really don't know us. And the same thing when we talk about them, we're talking about the secondary character in our story because we really don't know them. Then when we understand that point, it becomes much more easy not to take things personally because yeah. we can see that there's things that you cannot avoid it because it's affecting you directly. And, but once that you don't take it personally, you don't react emotionally in that way, then with that clear mind, you can have a better answer for any circumstance that is happening in your life. And that gives you um, a big advantage over everybody else because while they take everything personally, they react, they are losing control but when you don't take it personally, you don't lose that control and you can think clearly and make a better decision and the outcome will be much better for you. Then not to take this personally, they give you certain kind of immunity within the interaction that you have with everyone around you. Yes, because I like, I like the way mm-hmm. you say, you know, 
whether it's good or bad, you don't take it personally, whether you perceive it as a as a positive comment or a negative comment. If you don't take it personally, it's like it gives you a certain um, personal freedom. Yeah, then it is much easier with yourself to live your life because you don't depend any longer on anybody else's opinion because you don't take personally their judgments, their opinions, etc. But you listen to what they say, and that will help you to make your decisions. So you respect what they say, but just don't take it to heart, really. Yes, and that makes your life much easier. And that really leads on to not making assumptions, because I think many of if i think through the situations where i have taken something personally nine times out of ten i've made an assumption <laughs> so and, i think and this those, is very interesting yeah i think those two because, go very much together those, those, those. <laughs> oh yes <laughs> the, the four agreements they go together they complement each other then uh, uh don't make assumptions well if you see we create all our knowledge. We use our language to understand everything that we perceive. And our knowledge, in certain point of our life, when the brain is mature enough, we start talking in our head with a voice that no one can hear but us. And we call it thinking. We start thinking. Then to think is the voice of knowledge. And if you see, most of our thoughts, there's nothing but assumptions. And there's assumptions because we really don't know. And if we don't know, we have to believe in something in order to feel safe. Then, of course, it's normal to make assumptions. But if you don't take it personally, and if you're uh, being back with the world, then most of the assumptions that you make will be the correct assumption. Because many times you don't have any other choice but to make assumptions because you don't have enough information, et cetera, et cetera. But you're not so disappointed when you find out that the assumption that you make is not that real. But on the other hand, if you're not impeccable with the world and you take things personally, most of the assumptions that you make, it really will create a big drama in in your head. And you start being worried about things that are not happening only in your imagination. And when finally the truth arrives, it will be a big uh, reaction into into your own mind. Then if you don't make assumptions that give you immunity, in the interaction that you have with yourself, it makes your life much, much easier. And to think about asking questions rather than always exactly. assuming. Mm. And sometimes I think the, everyone. Yeah, the oh, more sorry. we know someone as well, I think the more, mm. the closer we are to people, the more we assume and the more we assume that they know, <laughs> they know <laughs> us. Yeah. Yes, we make the assumption that we know what we think, that they that they should know what what we believe, that they should know the way we want to be treated, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah, yeah. And then the, the the last of the four agreements, so always do your best, is such a lovely a lovely agreement. But it also, for me personally, um, it's something my father used to say from you know from when I was a little, little girl, right the way through to he, he died last year. And almost the last thing he said when he was able to talk was, just do your best. And so that, that has always been very significant to me, that that was one of the agreements. Well, this is my favorite one, definitely. Because that's what makes us uh, special or not, you know? In our imagination, we have lots of ideas, hundreds of ideas, thousands of ideas. If we don't take action, all those ideas will dissipate and we'll never 
will manifest our ideas. With the action, we will manifest whatever comes into our brain. When we understand that point, we can understand the creation of all those different civilizations around the planet Earth, like the Egyptian civilization, like the Greeks, the Romans, the Hindus, the Celtics, the Toltecs, everyone around the world. Whatever you can see around, around you and what you dress and everything, first exists in the human imagination. And with the action, we manifest it. And now we can see computers, we see planes, we see cars. You know, we see all what we humans create. And this is because we take the action to whatever ideas are happening in our mind. And this is definitely my favorite one. Because by doing our best, Humanity keep evolving more and more and more. That makes sense to the other three agreements yeah. because that is what will make really the difference because it's not just you. It's everyone around you, the way that you interact, not just with humanity, but with the entire nature. You know, when when just that way, you learn to to love and respect everything around you, all kind of life. Yes, I think um, also with always do your best. It kind of when you do feel that perhaps you're not being, or you you are very because you become so aware. If you are not impeccable with your word, you become very aware if you're making um, assumptions or you're taking things personally. And I think the always do your best also has an impact on that because you, your awareness is such that you think, right, well, I'm doing my best. Okay, I didn't do so well just then, but I am definitely going to do better from here on. And I think that that, that really helps. And it is, you know, it's about taking action, but it's also about accepting that you're not going to be perfect the, the, just because you've, you've read the book. You know, it, it takes time um, to implement and to, and to grow with it, I think. You know, there's uh, something that, well, a little sad, but, but true, that we corrupt everything. We also corrupt the four agreements. And we change the four agreements into what I can say the four conditions. And we use all those conditions in order to auto domesticate, to domesticate ourselves and, and to judge ourselves and to blame ourselves and to feel guilty about ourselves because we are not being impeccable with the world, because we are, not, we are taking many things personally, because we make assumptions because we didn't do our best. Then we use these four agreements as a condition to accept ourselves. And this is not what we try to do at all. Mm. And this is the reason why we say, oh, I'm not perfect because I'm not doing what I should do. Well, the truth is that we are perfect just the way we are. Every single human is perfect. Everything in nature is perfect. Everything that exists is really perfect. What happened is that we don't have the awareness of our own perfection. Every single human is perfect just the way it is. You know, um, every, every human is unique. You can see that there is no one like you. It never was anyone like you. It never will be anyone like you. You are completely different to everyone else. And at the same time, you cannot be anybody else. You only can be you. And there's mm. something that with awareness, we can accept it. When we accept that and we can see ourselves, 
we start seeing ourselves in a completely different way. We can appreciate what we are. We were accepting ourselves very soon. We start loving ourselves just the way we are. And we start getting the awareness that, yes, we are perfect just the way we are. But also we can see that everybody around us, they are also perfect the way they are, but they don't know because they use everything that they learn as a condition to accept themselves. Mm. And if they don't accept themselves, it's because they are judging and giving opinions. And they have those judgments and have all those opinions because that's what we hear since we were children. When we grew up, we see all the adults having opinions, judging each one, every, uh, one to another. We go to school, same thing. You know, when I was a, a, a student, I hear so many times in so many ways that nobody's perfect. Well, mm. I don't think it's true at all. It's just a big excuse, and we use it in order to justify uh, ourselves. Like when we make a mistake, I say, well, what do I expect? I'm not perfect. I'm just a human. Well, wrong. <laughs> We're perfect just the way we are. We, we mm. don't have to use that lie any longer because this is the biggest lie that we are using right now. The idea yeah. of per- imperfection only exists in the human mind. It doesn't exist in the dogs or the cats or the elephant. Mm. They're perfect just the way they are. There's no judgment. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Exactly. And this is because we are not impeccable with the world. And because we are not impeccable to the world, we take it personally, we make assumptions, and perhaps we don't do our best. And I can kind of feel that this also leads in to um, the fifth agreement and looking at our our divinity and looking at truth and that truth is really beyond belief. I mm-hmm. think a lot of the messages you you and uh, and and um, Don Jose um, wrote about were were again extremely powerful. Um, I think it would be helpful to maybe talk about the fifth agreement a little bit, so because many people may not have read that yet, certainly in the UK. Okay, uh, well, uh, the four agreements is the introduction of a different way of life. And I call it the way of life of the artist. By the way, the word Toltec means artist. But in that point of view, every single human that exists in the planet Earth is an artist. Even if we don't have the awareness of our own art, we are artists. We are always creating we create all the time. Then with these four agreements, we can shift our point of view from the one who is victimized by everything that is happening around, that all those big events that happen outside and inside of our body into the eye of the artist. You know, the artist is searching for beauty all the time. And this is what makes an artist someone extremely special, especially when we have the awareness that we are artists. Then the four agreements is the introduction of the way of life of the artist. And of course that requires practice because it's practice what makes the master. And this only just tool for transformation that will not work if we don't apply it and if we don't practice it. Then when we practice these four agreements, let's try not to do it, not to change it into four conditions. No. Let's keep it uncorrupted and let's use it without any judgment. Yes, we took it personally. It's okay. We took it personally. We have the awareness. Next time we would not take it personally. Then by practicing very soon, you don't take this personally, you don't make assumptions any longer, uh, you are more impeccable with the world, and you always try to do your best. Well, after just a practice, 
when finally you master that art is when the fifth agreement arrives because that is the conclusion of what the four agreements begin. Then the fifth agreement is be skeptical but learn to listen. Be skeptical is easy to understand because we already know that every single human, they create their own story and they use what they believe is true to create that story, which means the way they use the world in order to create their own story. But there's seven billion of humans and everyone believes that what they say is the truth and everybody else is wrong. Well, when we are skeptical, we already know that everyone will express what they believe is true. And perhaps it's true for each one of them, but not necessarily is true for me. Then when I learn to listen, then very humbly I listen what they say and the things that I agree with, I take it and I use it in order to improve the story of my life. And all those things that is obvious, that is a big lie, we don't have to judge it or have opinion against whatever they say. We just don't use it. And in that way, we gain respect, which is what will make the whole difference. With respect, we find peace. Mm. And what I say many times is, be skeptical is, don't believe me, don't believe yourself, and don't believe anybody else, but learn to listen. When we apply that to ourselves, don't believe myself, I will not believe my life, but I will listen my, uh, my life. Once I listen and I have the awareness that it's not true, those lies will not have any effect on me any longer. And all the big battle, all the big conflict that exists in between truth and lies in my head is over because I just don't believe my own lies. Mm. Then I'm no longer in battle, I'm no longer in conflict, then I find my inner peace. And because I cannot give what I don't have, well, once I have my peace, I love myself just the way I am. Now I can give my respect, I can give my love, and we, I find peace in the relationships that I have with my beloved, with my children, with my friends, with my brothers, with my parents, with everyone around me. I can find peace. Because I have peace inside me, I find also peace out, outside of me. And with that uh, peace agreement, it, it ends completely the, the, is the story that we created for. And from that moment on, we recreate a better story based in love, based in respect, based in peace. And it's, it's, it's a new way of being that I call it, just to call it that way, the way of life of a master, the way of life of the real artist. So it's really coming into um, a very creative aspect um, and creating, recreating and creating something that is based on truth and love and um, you you actually do challenge us and ask us to join in changing the world um, and your invitation is to be authentic and to be free. Yes, it's something that I start uh, asking my children after my, my heart attack because uh, Don Jose came to me and say, Father, you, you, you give me so much. How can I uh, repay you? How can I, what can I do for you? 
Is there anything I can do? I say, oh, well, of course you can do something for me. And I tell him, please, tell me to change the world. She <laughs> said, oh, no, to change the world <laughs> is a lot. And I say, oh, don't be silly, Sam. I'm talking about the world that you create, your own creation, not the world of everybody else, just your world. Help me to change your world. I give you the tools, you take the action, and you change your, your own world. Because if you are able to change your whole world, your own world, just like magic, everything will change for you. And that's the way that you can pay me for what you learn by changing your world. And then he starts using, okay, he starts telling everybody, okay, help us to change the world. <laughs> change your world. And, and the way to change your world is that by trying to change all the secondary characters of your story because that will not work. The only way to change your world is by changing the main character of your story, which is what you believe you are. If you are able to change yourself, just like magic, everyone around you starts changing and your world changes completely. And just imagine if everyone around you start changing their own world and they start going as a ripple all around humanity, how long will it take until the entire humanity changes their personal world? If that happens, the entire humanity will also change. And of course, this is the direction that humanity is going. We can witness that in history. You know, just imagine that you wake up uh, tomorrow a thousand years in the past, in the Middle Ages, knowing everything that you know right now, believing everything that you believe right now. If you wake up in the Middle Ages, there in England, and you see the way everybody believes, the way they treat each other, you will find out that, wow, these people are really barbarians. And if you try to teach what you know, how long do you think it takes since the Inquisition take you mm. and make you confess that you make a deal with the devil? As you can see, yes, we are going to the right direction. And yes, there's many conflicts that have been in, in the entire humanity during all those years, but the awareness is getting better and better and better. You know, with all those computers we have right now, whatever happened in one moment is known around the world, and everybody's seeing what is really happening all around the world. Then, yes, I definitely, they're going in the right direction. Yes. And you, you have actually said that it's time for psychology to catch up with science and technology um, because messages can go around the world so quickly. Yes, it's, it's catching now with science and technology. It's happening. Mm. But of course, there's a lot of resistance. But it's really happening. I love that you ask us to have a love affair with life, so um, I really re resonate with that. And to make ourselves happy to do what we love to do and enjoy every single moment of our lives. I think that, that if we all did that, what an incredible difference that would make. Well, it is happening. It's taking time, but it's happening. And of course, there's a lot of resistance, which is completely logical. But we are going into the right direction. Well, just imagine now the opposite, that you wake up a thousand years in the future, and you see in the history the way we live right now. With that point of view, you will say, oh, my God, they were barbarians. <laughs> they thought that they will find happiness outside of them. They thought that they would find love outside of them. And they treat each other in that way. The love they used, it was conditional. 
and look the result of use conditional love for the conflict, all the injustice, all the poverty, all the war, etc., etc. They will say, oh, these people from the 21st century, they were barbarians. Well, in that point of view, we are barbarians. And yes, we're going into the right direction. There is no doubt about it. We are going into the right direction. Well, it's um, you're very inspiring, um, Don Miguel, and I'm sure it's going to, it's just going to be amazing to have you here in the UK. And uh, I know that you're here in October, and um, that you're going to be at the Hay House You Can Do It event. Um, yes. I believe I believe you're actually in Glasgow and in London. Yes, in both places. And like I said before, it's a dream that is coming true for me. It's the very first time that I will be in England, and I love it. <laughs> well, we will <laughs> love having you here. So I think the, the Glasgow event, I believe, is on Sunday the 6th of October, and the London event is on Sunday the, um, I think that's the 13th of October. So um, for people, wherever they are in the UK, hopefully they can get along to see you there. But something I thought was really exciting was um, that I heard that you have put together um, the Agreements for Life. Um, this is a new project, I understand, that you're about to launch on October the 15th? Yes, and it's, uh, it will be once a day and it's a, a, with video. It's a whole program, 30 days, and will be amazing. It will be so good. And that really will change to all of us to change our personal world, to change. So it's going to be a 30-day. It's a, just to be clear, it's a 30-day program, is it? Um, but every day? Yes, it's for 30 days. And the, and you're you're setting that out really for people to rediscover themselves in this wonderful program. Yes, it's by just by using common sense. Then what you hear it makes sense to you, and whatever you think works for you, you take it, you apply it in your life. And what it don't work for you, just don't use it. But there's so many. Uh, Great new agreements that can help to to practice and change our own world, and this is because many people uh, tell me how difficult it is really to apply these four agreements. And what I do is to to do another one to support these four agreements because the only one that we need is these four agreements, the fifth agreement, of course. But in that way, it may simplify everything and help us to change our own world. That's really wonderful. That's wonderful. We're almost at the end of our of our um, lovely conversation, Don Miguel. But um, and I'm just so grateful to you for this time that you've given us today. Um, and I just wonder if there's maybe one thing you'd like to leave us with, some message you'd like to give us um, for us to think about, or maybe well, just uh... be just to be rather. Than to <laughs> Well, what I'd like to tell all of you is that we humans, we come here to this planet Earth with one mission, and it's the same for all of us, the same mission. And our mission is just to enjoy life, to be happy, to protect our physical body. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, there's seven billion ways how to do it, and you have your own way because only you know what is what makes you happy and what is what makes you unhappy. Oh, that's so lovely. That's so lovely. Well, thank you. Thank you again for being on the show tonight, Don Miguel. And uh, Haroon Rabani, the founder of this show and also of Untangled FM, wanted me to extend his blessings and thanks to you as well. And my love and gratitude goes to you and your family for being such incredible messengers. And for anybody who wants to um, either book for the You Can Do It event or to find out more about um, the, the wonderful um, the Agreements for Life program that uh, Don Miguel is just about to launch on the 15th of October, you can go to um, Miguel uh, Ruiz 
uh, com, and that link will be on the Untangled FM website. Um, so thank you for everyone listening to the Consciousness Revolution show tonight. I really hope you enjoyed and benefited from the wisdom and love our guest, Don Miguel Riz, master artist and Toltec Nawal, has shared with us tonight on this Consciousness Revolution show. I am Caroline Adair, and I will be back on Monday, the 30th of September, with my guest, who is a Hay House author, Becky Walsh, and she'll be talking to us about how to act on our intuition instantly. So it will be the same time, the same place, and in the meanwhile, big love to you all. Good night. freedom.